Welcome to another episode of American Reef. I'm Russ Kickle, and today we're going to have part two of the Mike Paletta LED lighting experiment, setting up a reef tank. First, let's have a word from our sponsors. Now with this part two segment, I think that both new hobbyists and experienced hobbyists will get something out of it, right? When you have somebody like Mike Paletta who has been in the hobby for 23 and above years, right? Simple explanations, for example, of you know how nitrates, for example, affect phosphate reduction and things like that. Those kind of conversations that he has while he's actually uh, you know, implementing like a GFO reactor, for example, are very beneficial. So therefore, again, I think that there's something in this episode for everybody. Now remember, if you're watching this video and you find value in it, please go to AmericanReef.com and subscribe to Reef Tutor. Again, not only will you uh, help these episodes continue to come, but also for that $2 monthly subscription, you'll basically get access to 200-ish kind of uh, reef keeping videos that again, you can load on your iOS device and you can watch and listen to, to and from your commute from work or other kind of times where you're waiting in the car. Now again, on to the experiment where we're gonna start off first of all with Mike actually showing us how to create a, a cover for the top of that tank that he set up. Now I'm just gonna show how to build a, the hood or lack of a hood for a cover for the tank so that mm -hmm. your fish don't jump out. <laughs> uh, this is very simple to make. Uh, you can buy the framing at any hardware store. Then you use a splining tool and spline. The toughest thing was to find this half inch uh, screen mm -hmm. that's clear, lets all light transmission through it, but it keeps the fish from jumping out. Right. So all you do is cut it to size. You buy these little corners that put it all together. Mm -hmm. And then all you gotta do is line Actually, you want to line it up so that way, so that it stays taut. And then you just lay your spline in. A little bit of space. Then you go over it with your splining tool. Here we are finishing up the last one. And one of the things that I did in order to get these as close to parallel as I could is I started with one side, put the splining in, then did the top and the bottom, then lifted the one side up and sort of moved it around. And that way I was able to get it parallel. So it right. looks straight and it's nice and tight. Right. Something I didn't explain before. So I also uh, put in the microwave for about three minutes to get it malleable because otherwise you saw the difficulty I was having before right, right. and this made it possible to finish it up. So it, this has been sitting for a while so it's not quite as malleable but it's e relatively easy to get in there. Sure. You just finish it up, trim the edges. And again for the reason why you're doing this is because... It is to make it taut so that the fish, if they jump up, don't get caught in it. Uh -huh. And the tightness also allows for better light transmission, because that's the one thing you're worried about. And that's one reason why people didn't use these tops before, mm -hmm. is we had metal halides and they would melt, but now that I'm using LEDs, you can make these out of the plastic fiberglass meshing, 
and that way you're protecting your fish and your investment because the thing that ticks a lot of us off is having fish jump out of a tank and this tank now will be perfectly sealed so for things like Helfrix fire fish or fairy wrasses which all have a tendency to jump that's not a problem anymore right. so that's one of the things I'm looking forward to with this tank is keeping small jumping fish in it <laughs> and not have them jump out and this allows me to do that because then once everything's in place no, oh, still gonna do one more cut. Then all you do is take your razor blade. Cut the screen. And to your point, if there's, you know, somebody's new and they need to piece of some parts, they can always hop over to Bulky Supply. Or, you know, Lowe's and Home Depot, right? Yeah, I mean... They'll cut it the size of the bulk reef supply, or if you're good with a hacksaw, you can cut this, and now bulk reef supply even carries the netting. I uh, got this on eBay. So, but, but as more people are doing LEDs and they're making these tops for their tank, right. the demand is going to increase. So you're going to see even more people carrying this, I would assume, yep. over Makes the next few months. Sense. It's like everything in this hobby. I mean, when I started... There was no one even making protein skimmers, so. <laughs> I mean, there, there was the old Sanders protein skimmer, which was a little green tube that hung in the tank and really didn't take out much, but that was all we had. And now we have all the European, all the Japanese skimmers, all the Chinese skimmers. So you can get a skimmer for any size and any amount you want because the man's there now. There we are. There we go. Nice and simple. And just sits right on the tank. And with the groove I put in for the one power head, everything's hidden and works great. Perfect. What's next? Next, now that the tank's about a little over two weeks and pretty stable, obviously I had to put a few corals in to test it, but the lighting is now producing a fair amount of algae. So now it's time to uh, put some snails in the tank to uh, start getting the algae under control. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm putting a few on each of the rocks. So now for the new hobbyist, why, why does the slime even start growing after? Just because from the live rock you had some nutrients released and once you have nutrients and light, the thing that you mainly get is algae. And the best way to control algae is to not let it take off and not let it become dominant in the tank. Okay. So, and now are you going to control the algae primarily with the snails, or do you have something else? No, we're going to we're going to add something else to the tank today. We're also going to add uh, two canisters. One is carbon. One is carbon. One is GFO. I have the carbon running into the GFO to try and save the GFO. Uh, mm -hmm. The GFO in this case, that's granulated ferric oxide. Mm -hmm. I use Ecofos, uh, Ling's Ecofos, to do it just because it's. I found it to be, for right. the money, the best one out there. Right. So by running these two in combination, I'll get the phosphate under control. We'll take some of the other nutrients out with the carbon. Uh, I'll change the carbon about once a month. Mm -hmm. The GFO will probably stay under six to nine months. And how I'll know that it's time to do it, you can do phosphate tests. Right. But unfortunately, other than ELOS and some other high-end uh, phosphate test kits, mm -hmm. they don't really measure organic phosphate. So all they measure is inorganic, and most of us read zero, but then we have algae blooms. We can't figure out why. Right. So best thing to look at is when you start growing hair algae, that means your phosphate levels are climbing up. <laughs> so as soon as I see that, I know it's time to change it. So that's the easiest test you can do, and it's relatively inexpensive. Right, right. But, I mean, when this came out like uh, 10 years ago, right. uh, the Europeans had a, a lot of different ferric oxides, and they had it on all their shops. So I went to like six or seven shops, right. and sitting at the front counter, everyone had boxes of this, right. and I never heard of it. So I brought some back with me. And the results on a tank where I had hair algae problems were miraculous. Right. Where you put it on and within three or four days the, the hair algae literally just disintegrates away. And I mean people accuse me of scrubbing it off the, out, off the corals, right. but it was just getting the, the phosphate under control. I right. mean this is one of the best things they've ever done for keeping SPS corals, right. was coming out with a means for controlling phosphate in an easy manner. I mean I don't use the pellets, I don't use anything else. But in addition to this, the other thing we're going to add, we're going to start adding some algae to the ecosystem uh, chamber of the reactor right. or of the sump. And by doing that, that will also help to get some of the phosphate under control. Because what's interesting is algae takes out uh, one part of phosphate for every 10 parts of nitrate. So it's better at taking out nitrate than phosphate, and, but nitrate will keep it from being able to take phosphate out. 
So you have to get your nitrate levels down in order for it to remove phosphate. Okay, hold on. So you covered a lot. So let's, let's just go over a couple things. First of all, um, you had said, number one, this is GFO. Right? There's a wet form and a dry form. Yeah. And the wet form is the hydroxide. And, and you have the dry form, which is the oxide. Any difference between the two of them? Over time, no. Okay, so bottom line, they, they both serve the they'll both, they'll both take everything out of the water that you want. Okay. I mean, and, some people will disagree, but I've not had it. I've, right. used, I've used just about everything that's out there. Right. Over time, they all basically work the same. Well, and again, everybody that watches this video realizes, like, to me, the only thing that has proven themselves, right, or to me, the things that have proven themselves over time. Yeah. It's only time sales, not manufacturers. And don't take this the wrong way, but your time, right? You've yeah. got the 28 years or yeah. whatever, so you know what works. And I, I've been using EcoFoss for five years, so right. I, I know that it works over time. Right. I ran uh, Foss Band, which worked really well. I ran uh, uh, Roa Foss, which was right. the first one that came out. That worked really well. I mean, they're all good. The Royal Foss is the most expensive. Right. Uh, the Foss Band and EcoFoss are about equally as expensive, and they're both manufactured here in the states. Right. So I, I'm trying to stay with as much stuff that's American made yes. as I can. Yep. Because I'm an American yeah. hobbyist. I mean, I, I love the Europeans, but I'm trying to make as much stuff that's made right. here. Well, it's Although I did buy the X in and out <laughs> for the overflow. So, although again, when you look at it, the, it's to promote the hobby, and, and it's not anything more than that, right? Yeah. You need it to get a foothold in the states. Right. And stay there. Okay, so that was the first thing we covered. Second thing we covered was number one, um, as far as phosphates go, the test kits out there, right? Right. Really only measure one type of phosphate. They all measure inorganic phosphate, right. not organic. Right. So organic is what the kind of phosphate that basically settles in your substrate, it's in your rocks, and it binds with things, so it's very difficult to test it. So you have to use a Hawk or a Elos test kits, which break down enzymatically the phosphate so that right. it's free so you can actually measure it. Right. But even those aren't as precise as uh, some right. of the scientific grades. But like I said, the easiest way to tell is when you're starting to grow algae, really uh, hair algae more than the, the, the gold algae right. or the brown algae right. that grows on the rocks or right. the glass, those aren't really as phosphate dependent mm -hmm. as hair algae is. Hair algae thrives in a high phosphate environment. And when I say high phosphate, uh, 0.03 and above. Mm -hmm. You don't want to get your phosphate levels down to absolute zero because phosphate is one of the crucial building blocks of energy for the coral. So they need to have some phosphate. Uh, using some of the systems out there, you can get it down to absolute zero. Right. And what typically happens then is the tips of the corals will start to bleach. Mm -hmm. That's how you know your phosphate levels are too low because the tips of the corals are the fastest growing section of the corals. And as such, if they don't have any phosphate, there's no energy to grow with, they basically starve out and they bleach. Right. So that, that's easy. I mean, there's ways to tell yeah, that we've learned. That, that makes sense over the over time, right? Again, yep. that, that works. Okay, so the next thing is that though phosphates right are good to keep in check, there's a relationship between nitrates and phosphates that that in, in terms of algae, there's a right. relationship between nitrates and phosphates with algae. I found a, a paper that showed that high nitrate levels will inhibit algae from extracting phosphate from the water. Mm -hmm. So what you have to do is get your nitrates into check and then when they do that it will also start to take out some phosphates. But they're not as efficient as removing phosphate as they are at nitrate. Right. None of the chlorpas are as efficient. You're, like I said, you're taking out 100 parts of nitrate for every one part of phosphate that you're taking out. So you're not going to get your phosphates under control just with an algae filter. Right. You're going to have to run some kind, or either not feed the fish <laughs> or, right. I mean, because one of the things I now do is when I'm feeding the fish I wash the food. Because right. when you p take the food out and put it in clean water and pour off the water that's in there, right. when you see how much particulates are in there, yeah. the fish for the most part don't eat that. Some of the corals do eat it, but for the most part it goes into the substrate, it's basically just waste. And it's, if you test it with a good phosphate test kit, it'll go off the scale. Right. So by doing that, you can reduce the amount of uh, phosphate remover that you need over time because you're not induce, uh, introducing as much phosphate into the water. Yeah, I, I have two reactors. The first one has carbon in it. The other one has GFO in it. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm using Ling's ecosystem. He makes two versions of it. He makes a fine powder and then he makes a large granular. I use the large granular downstairs on a reverse flow one because what's nice about it is if you put the fine one in the, in the large reactor with reverse flow, it basically grinds into right. dust and in a month or two, it's gone. Right. 
In here where it's just straight flow through and it's in a canister, you can use the finer stuff and you'll take out a, a lot for a long period of time. Right. I run the carbon first because that takes out a lot of garbage beforehand. Mm -hmm. It basically saves the life expectancy and the carbon is a lot cheaper to use. I mean, I'm using Elo's carbon, which is a high-end carbon, so I don't right. need that much. Right. But it basically protects the GFO for a longer period of time. And you had said that you expect that probably you'll change the carbon once every... Six to nine. I'll change the carbon once a month, once every six weeks. Okay. And I'll change the GFO probably once every six to nine months. And you'll base that on the hair on GFO. Yeah. I mean, I, I have a, a high-end phosphate test kit. Right. As good as it is, it's easier just to look. I can see when I'm starting to get hair algae. I mean, it right. pops up amazingly out overnight and once you switch this out it disappears overnight right. so it's not something I really have to worry about which is before you used to, used to always have to worry about it suffocating all right. your corals because right. I mean it would grow over and there was actually just an, an article I read um, I think it was in uh, Coral Magazine mm -hmm. that showed that macroalgae produce compounds that inhibit the growth particularly of stony corals which is no big shock right. but it's the first time they found these compounds that's one of the reasons also for running carbon and keeping your algae under in check right. is I've had corals die because they were overgrown by calerpa or other algaes so by doing this I no longer have to worry about that and now do you have any kind of way to test for when it's time to replace the carbon? Uh, it's just, I, you sort of know over time. You know, you know that carbon doesn't last a long period of time. Mm -hmm. Some people only run it for a week and then take it off for three weeks. Right. Some people keep it on. Realistically, it's probably exhausted after a week and it becomes more of a biological filter than anything. Right. And just more than, or less due to sheer laziness, I wait right. once a month to do it and that seems to work pretty well. I'm, I'm, uh, there's probably uh, three to 350 grams of carbon in this reactor, mm -hmm. so it's a fairly large amount for this tank. Right. Over time, I might need to reduce it or I might need to increase it. The nice thing about being able to run this all the time, it keeps the water crystal clear so I don't have to run ozone or UV. Mm -hmm. And I can do that because I'm running the ecosystem mud filter mm -hmm. so I don't get lateral line disease in my fish. Mm -hmm. Before when I used to run carbon or still with a lot of individuals that are running carbon over a period of time, you'll start to see lateral line disease in your tank, your angelfish. Right, right. Uh, for people that run a ton of carbon, I've even seen it in damselfish, which right. is kind of appalling. <laughs> but. Right. But by running the ecosystem, I've never had a problem with lateral line. And Ling has even run experiments where he bought purple tangs mm -hmm. and angelfish mm -hmm. with lateral line, put them into tanks that had the ecosystem mud filter, and within three to six months, the lateral line was completely healed up. Right, right. And I've not seen that with any other compound or technology. So right. just for keeping the fish's colors vibrant, not having to worry about running carbon, keeping the water clear, the, the whole system works. Right. Do the whole system though. Yeah, I, I've basically been running this system, which I, when I say this system, ecosystem filter with a skimmer, with uh, a uh, uh, right, phosphate removing compound for the past 10 years. Right. And to me, that's been the best system for, in terms of getting growth in the corals and getting maximum coloration in terms of just the overall health of the tank. Right, right. Okay, so let's get cracking then. So, what I did to power it, it's just a power head that I've modified. When I say modified, I basically filled up the air hole with uh, super glue. Okay. And so that will keep that plugged up because I'm not trying to draw air in. And by forcing pressure up here, if I didn't have that plugged up, the water would just shoot out here. I wouldn't get any water through here. Right. So this just gets mounted in the one end of the chamber, flows into here, runs back through here, and then gets drained back into the tank. Okay. Now the thing to remember with these fittings is you think you have them in far. You have to make sure they're in all the way. Is the first time I ran this, I wasn't thought I had them in all the way, right, right. and I was shooting water all over right. the cabinets. So I've learned push it in harder than you think. Right, exactly. So what I'm going to do is just put these in the back. So again, we've got bulk supply media reactors, right? Yeah. Deal. And I'm going to cut this back, and this is a rough cut. And just take your time. So you don't really compress it, so it'll fit in the fitting real well. Just put that down there. I guess one point to keep in mind too is easy access, so you can change stuff relatively easy. Yeah. Well, that's why I have this shutoff valve. Uh -huh. I can turn it off, unscrew this, take it out. It's fairly simple. Right. Right. And then I run this. You can feel it 
sort of go into the fitting and be, and be taut. And that's basically it. I mean, it's going to be a little self-contained unit. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't shoot around because I'm not running a ton of water through it. And the thing you've got to realize is you don't want to run, you know, 5,000 gallons an hour through here. If you run 100, 150 gallons, you're fine because right. all you're trying to do is give the water contact time with the media. You're not right. trying to pressurize <laughs> it. You're, right. So you, you don't need a huge power head to drive this. Right. So Before we plug it in, yeah, uh, yeah I, I didn't rinse either compound, so they're mm -hmm. going to produce a fair amount of dust and stuff. Right. But by having a good skimmer, it's sort of a test for the skimmer. Right. It takes it all out pretty well. And actually, what I I used to rinse out the carbon, but what I found is having that real fine particulate right. really extracts a lot of stuff out of the water. Does it really? It, uh, because there's such a large surface area, when you consider the, the finely ground, I mean, that's what we would use, but you couldn't have a reactor that could hold it. Sure. So sure. by just letting the dust go through, because it basically all gets skimmed out back into the skimmer, uh -huh. the next day cleaning the skimmer's a pain, mm -hmm. but I've taken out a lot of... Uh, dirtiness in the water. Right. And if I ever have a problem where the water is exceptionally cloudy, I'll even take some carbon and grind it up, uh -huh. sort of toss it in the chamber with the skimmer. Okay. It'll take out a lot of the gunk and then it'll get skimmed out. And it's a, a much easier way to really clean the water okay. than anything else I've done. Oh, cool. Okay, what's your dog's name? And this is Lucy. She actually likes the fish. When she was little, she used to put her paws up on the other tank and bark at them. <laughs> but now the, the Best shot I saw of her, she was sitting downstairs on the chair uh -huh. looking at the tank. So <laughs> she's, right. she's got, I've got her hooked too. So <laughs> get her her own little tank, huh, Lucy? That's right. <laughs> so what's next? Let's see. Next, what we're going to do is we're going to add the algae to the uh, ecosystem filter. And what's interesting is the algae also has a lot of animals in it. So by doing that, I'm basically inoculating the tank with amphipods, copepods, worms, stuff like that. And that will get this tank going. But then the other cru crucial thing is you have to illuminate it. Yep. And unlike what used to be the algae turf scrubbers where you ran them on an alternate system, right. first I'm lighting them with an LED system. So this is going to be really bright light on this. So this will give the calerpa will really take off in here and take a lot of the nutrients out of the water right. and grow really fast. So once a month or two, I'll be harvesting algae out of this system. The other thing that will happen with this is it's on 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't go into what's called the dark reaction cycle for for calerpas. Right. And by not doing that, it doesn't produce the yellowing compounds that you typically see with an algae turf scrubber system, but it also doesn't go into proliferation mode. Mm -hmm. So you're not suddenly going to have huge amounts of calerpa growing in here. The calerpa will just be straight, trained down to here right. because of the 24-hour light cycle. Right. So it doesn't allow it to go into propagation. So you have it contained where you want it, which is what you really want in a, sure. in a system. Right. Now, are there any calerpas that are better or worse? You know, I, I've used there. just about all of them, and I've actually put in mixed beds of different calerpas. Uh -huh. And what happens is you generally get one that will predominate. Okay. And you could use just about any one. Mm -hmm. uh, some some people start. We started off with taxifolia, but now taxifolia is banned in some states mm -hmm. because it it's, uh, really grows like a weed. Right. But for our purposes, it's really good. I don't have to worry about it in Pennsylvania because there's not likelihood that this is going to foul anything. Right. But in other areas, uh, you're not allowed to do that. Right. But any calerpa will take off. Under the right conditions. I mean, it, it is right. a weed wherever it is. <laughs> so, not that many things eat it. I mean, if you ever taste it, which I've done, <laughs> it's incredibly bitter. Uh -huh. So, there's a reason why organisms don't like to eat it because it right. tastes bitter. Right. I mean, some things like tangs and other fish will eat it when it's like the last resort, mm -hmm. but calerpa is generally not their favorite item. But by putting it in here and letting it take off, this is sort of the original ecosystem mode, right. even though I also run a skimmer in here. Good, yeah. So, what I'm going to do is just take this. LED transformer out. You can see this is a Marineland one that uh, my friend Tony Nista got for me. And do you really care about how many watts that you're going to put on it, you know, for growing it? Uh, you generally want to have a decent amount of light, but you don't have to go crazy because mm -hmm. it is on 24-7. Mm -hmm. I'm just doing this because one, Tony got this for me for a really good price, mm -hmm. and two, I'm trying to grow this as fast as I can to get the tank stabilized as quickly right. as I can. So that, that's the advantage of okay. it. Okay, good deal. Now in terms of just putting a calerpa in, what I'm going to have to do in a little bit, once this takes off, is put another layer of uh, egg crate here to hold it into place. But for now what I'm going to do is just sort of push it gently into the substrate. Now it's not a, a root plant like you would think of. 
because it doesn't really have roots, but it does have holdfasts. Mm -hmm. And this Calerpa, I don't know what the species is. Uh, I've been using this one for about 10 years, mm -hmm. and it started from a mixed bed mm -hmm. that I got from various other aquarists that were keeping ecosystem filters, and this is the one that took off and grows the fastest. So right. just for that reason, that's why I'm using it. Uh, right. I'm not a uh, taxonomist for <laughs> different species of Calerpa. That's not <laughs> what I want to be known for. Right. So. Okay, now we're going to turn the marine light LED on, and you can see, needless to say, it's really bright. Right. And what's nice about this is it doesn't produce any hum, unlike a typical fluorescent fixture. And since this tank is in my family room where I watch TV, right. I don't have to crack the sound up. And because it's an LED, it's going to pretty much last forever. <laughs> right. So I'm not turning it on and off. It's on all the time, and it'll be sort of the nightlight down here as well, even though there'll be a nightlight on here with the... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, aqua illuminator sold bulbs above running a, a moonlight cycle right. you still it's nice to have a nightlight when you come down to look at the tank in the middle of the night so this will provide just a little bit of light in the room right and the last thing we're going to do is the thing that people tend to neglect but is a, a major time saver and basically cuts down on the amount of pain in doing this is setting something up for water top off right uh for this 75 gallon tank we're going to have a five gallon reservoir sitting behind the tank it's basically just a bucket that will have a lid on it so that Lucy doesn't get into it yeah. and nothing else, bugs or anything else fall into it. Fill it up once a week because this tank loses a, a little less than a gallon a day. Mm -hmm. So it'll take me about uh, every five or six days I'll fill it up. And what I have to fill it up with is a really nice top-off system by Tunze, the Tunze Osmolator. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we often talk about with reef tanks is stability. And the nice thing about the Tunze Osmolator is you only have to be down a couple of millimeters and the water pump kicks in, puts enough water back in to keep the level high. So you're not to have this constant gushing of fresh water into the tank. You get a small amount several times a day, actually probably like 20 times a day, as the water evaporates out of the tank. And by doing that, you keep the tank nice and stable. And what else is nice about this sensor or this uh, panel is it shows you when the water's too high, when it's just right, when the pump's on, or when it's too low. So if you have the pump far enough away where you can't hear it, you can still tell that it's on simply by this being on. It's relatively simple to put together. Uh, it took us about 10 minutes to do so. And it's nice because it has a nice big magnet to hold everything into place. The uh, eyelet sensor has, or the uh, sensor has to just be touching the tip of the water so you can manipulate it up and down. And even on the magnet box itself, there's a little float that you can move it up or down by a couple of millimeters just to get the precise level of water you want within the tank. Right. Now it looks like there's a lot of stuff in here, but because of the lights and everything, it's also easy to work in here. And now I'll probably get some algae growing in here over time, but that's not a big concern. The main thing I want when I have a sump is accessibility and ease of working within it. And other than taking, having to take the light out to work in it, that's basically the only difficulty I'll have. But sure. other than that, the system's nice and simple. Mm -hmm. You can easily change everything. You can easily take everything out. And there aren't a, loose, a lot of loose wires or anything that can get wet in here. Right. So basically, you're, I'm safe from uh, electrocuting myself <laughs> so far. But we'll try something new. The only, only other things I have is I have two heaters. I just added a new heater under here. Uh -huh. uh, one of the things I, I didn't talk about, but I recommend is rather than putting one big heater in, mm -hmm. put two smaller heaters in. Because the main reason why tanks get destroyed is one heater jams or jams on mm -hmm. and cooks the tank. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many people have called me because their tanks got to 90 degrees Bam. because their heater was stuck. Right. So the, the heaters now are a lot better. They don't tend to stick as much as the older ones, mm -hmm. but there's still that possibility. So I run 200 watt heaters on here rather than one 200 watt heater. Mm -hmm. Costs about 20 bucks, but if I don't wipe out the tank, yeah. it's 20 bucks well spent. Right. And you can figure the average life of a heater is probably two to three years. Mm -hmm. Don't figure it's going to last much longer than that. Uh, there actually are some new uh, heaters that I actually just saw, they're coming on the market that aren't the tubes anymore. They're actually right. sort of metal boxes right. that you can bump, you can take out of the water. Actually, if you take them out of the water, they'll shut off. Right. Versus these heaters, if you take them out of the water, they'll crack. Right. Uh, this is one of the major reasons why I've almost got electrocuted is <laughs> doing a water change, letting the water run down in here and not realizing it was dry. It cracked, I pumped the water back in. Right. And <laughs> so one of the other suggestions is when you work on your tank, Work where there's carpeting or wear tennis shoes all the right, time. Right. Uh, you'll still feel a shock. If you have any cuts on your fingers, you'll feel that right, there's electricity right, in the water, kind of, right. but you won't get electrocuted. <laughs> and the heater is one of the main things that will electrocute you. It is that and the power heads. So. Okay, so now explain why two smaller ones won't cause the same issue. Because odds are only one will kick on, uh -huh. and one kicking on generally doesn't have enough power 
to totally heat the tank beyond to 90 degrees. Right. Uh, most of these can heat the water like five to eight degrees above room temperature. Mm -hmm. So obviously if your room is 40 degrees, you're gonna have a problem. Right. But most of our, us keep our homes between 65 and 75. Mm -hmm. So it'll bump it up. This 100 water will bump it up to 70, 72 degrees. The other one will bump it up to 77, 78 degrees. Mm -hmm. That's basically all I want. If it goes much beyond that, I don't have I don't heat the water to 80 degrees. Right, right. So by running two of them, I got it 77, 78 max, and I don't have to worry about any either the heater's kicking on and cooking the tank. Perfect. Perfect. Last things we're going to do to the tank is we're going to add a little bit more flow. Even though this is primarily going to be an LPS tank that doesn't require a ton of flow, I like the flow. And what's nice is with good flow and with pulsing, you get really nice glitter lines. All right. And I'm basically going to be running this uh, Ocean Pulse Duo with these two little uh, high door pumps. Uh -huh. And we're going to run these off. But what else is nice is I'm getting pulsating from the returns, as I, we talked about two weeks ago. Right. So the water's moving pretty good in here. Primarily, I just want to keep the detritus stirred up, and I'm going to make a couple little manipulations of the tank to increase where the flow is to keep some of the detritus from settling on the rocks. That's right. the main thing I'm looking to do. So whereas this pump is flowing primarily over to the front, and the pulser is flowing to the front, I'm going to blow this one across the rocks. So it just adds a little bit more flow across the system, and it keeps a little bit more of the detritus from settling on things. And then how does that, you know, the, the controller kind of... This controller, can you can do it in seconds. You can pulse anywhere from 10 seconds to 90 seconds, or you can do it by minutes. Okay. So what I'm going to do initially is start off on like a 90-second pulse. Then I may change it to like every two or three minutes. Sure. sure. But I, I, it's something you can play with relatively easily. All it takes is turning of a knob. Right. And it's not as expensive as the old electronic wave makers used to be. I mean, it's right. a, about a $50 to $70 part. Versus the old uh, wave makers used to be 140, 150. Right, right. So this is a lot simpler way to change the water motion within here. And as I said, this is primarily an LPS tank. They don't really like humongously strong flow, right. but they do like some flow. Particularly the euphilias and things like that do need current across or they tend to decay and rot. Right, so right. this is going to be something else fun to try within the tank just to see uh, right. what it does. Okay. We'll just push this down here. So, now we have flow from here. So I'm going to lower this just a hair because it's probably picking up from here. There we go. Is there any value in actually keeping one higher and one lower in the tank as well? Yeah, but one of the things I'm trying to do is, is use this to sort of increase the flow coming out of the Got pump it. here. Yeah. So trying to have it be more random so it's catching it here and then it'll blow it across here and by both of those I'm trying to keep the detritus in the tank down to a minimum and you can see already blown right, some of the yeah. stuff off the rocks so that then leads us to the last thing we're going to do which is add some live sand to the bottom because while this looks nice nobody wants to have big bricks sitting on the bottom of the tank yeah. uh, you know it's just a personal <laughs> choice some people may but not me. <laughs> so the thing before I do, before I add the sand, is pull off any of the hermits that I see on the bottom because they don't really like to be covered with sand. They're funny that way. And I think I've got most of them. So then we will get our trusty razor blade. I mean, there's certain tools that they never tell you in a hobby you're going to use a lot. One of which is razor blades. The other one is a bulb baster. Yes, that's right. right. Now what I'm going to add now is the substrate on the bottom. I use a rag of live live sand. Uh -huh. uh, have had no problems with it. I've used it in a lot of tanks. I used to run bare bottom for a lot of years. Uh -huh. Some people still do. Uh, the only problem I really have with bare, well, some of the problems I have with bare bottom, one, it looks a lot more natural to have substrate on the bottom. Right. But two, if I grew large corals, the bottoms of them would tend to bleach out because they weren't getting any reflected light off the bottom. Uh -huh. 
by running white substrate, I get reflection back. I don't have the death in the core as they get bigger. Oh, so okay. it looks a lot more natural. Yeah. And I can also, I keep a lot of wrasses and a lot of uh, animals that live in the substrate, uh, manners and stuff. And by having substrate, you grow a lot of microfauna, which also helps to feed them. I mean, you get some in the rocks, but the substrate, you get a lot more. I mean, right. in my downstairs tank, the amount of stuff that's living in the sand at night is an amazing amount of organism. Right. So right. putting this in will just basically finalize the tank. And then over the next two weeks, I will start adding corals. I'll basically harvest from downstairs, pack this tank, and then probably refill down there. Now, I, I got to let the stuff down there grow because uh, I've just gotten out of hand because there's just been so many nice corals coming in. Right. For a, a coral addict like me, it's just right. been really bad. But this is pretty much... It. We'll see, we got you on tape, right? So what we'll do is we'll come back on my Oh, I've been on tape for years saying I'm not buying another coral. And then uh, as I've given talks around the country, my friends have laughed because I'm always bringing frags right. back. Right. But right. now it's not like it used to be where everybody used to give you frags. Now when people are selling little tiny frags of right. named corals for $50 and $100, it's a lot tougher to get frags off of people. Right. But right. I mean, I, I still give away frags when people come and visit here. Right. So, <laughs> so I, you're not all invited to come visit right yet. Okay, so hold on. On the choice of substrate, do you care? Fat, thin, you know? I try to have some texture to it. I don't want it packed down tight because then all the detritus just settles in there. And I'm going to put sand sifting stars and other things in here to keep the sand kind of stirred up. Uh -huh. uh, and by doing that, it, it will keep it alive. Right. It doesn't really get black or dirty. And then when I do a water change, I, I actually put a fork, I learned this from Tony Vargas, right. I put a fork on the end of the uh, tube that I'm drawing from, stir it around the substrate and take out as much dirt as accumulates in there as I can. Right. So by doing that, I, I make it a lot easier. The other thing I got to do is I got to turn off the water when I do this, because otherwise the sand just blows all over the place. So I'm going to do that real quick. So before we add the sand, okay, how do you know how many bags of sand to add? Each bag handles about a foot by 18 inches. Uh -huh. So if you measure how much empty space you have in your tank, which uh -huh. isn't that difficult, it's somewhat difficult, right. but this is a four foot by two foot tank, so it has roughly eight square feet. Right. But if you deduct how much space is taken up by the stones, that's taken up roughly three square feet. So I have to cover up five square feet. Right. So even though I only put two bags in, I probably need another third bag. That'll cover up approximately five square feet. Right. That's what I'm looking at. Okay, got so, it. You know, it, it's, you can be up or, or down a half an inch. Right. It's not going to make a huge difference. Like I said, the main thing I'm looking for, those stones are one inch high. Right. I want to have those covered as much as I can. And once I put in a couple more pieces of live rock, which will rest on there, as well as the corals that live on the sand, you won't even notice the, the, the stones right. or the uh, fiberglass right. rods coming up or any of it. it. Basically, everything will be hidden. So right. it's pretty easy once, once you get a feel for what you're right. doing. It, yeah. it takes a while. There's a lot more art to this than science once you really get into it, but there is a lot of science as well. And the nice part about this is a rule of thumb, go from there. And do you ever have to worry about, you know, whatever, chemicals or something that got on the sand or on the plastic bag? I usually rinse the bags, but they're okay. usually pretty good. And this has been kept alive for a while. It had, does have an expiration date on it, so you, you, you can't keep this forever. And you also don't want this to freeze or get too hot. Even, definitely don't want it to get too hot. Really? Yeah. And as you can see, it makes a nice mess in the tank initially. And I'll just do another further cut. And is the live sand really live? It's live in terms of having bacteria in it, mm -hmm. but it's not live like the old live sand that uh, people used to harvest in the Keys and stuff and send up with all kind of microfauna in it. Basically everything you got to do, you got to sort of get from another tank or from live rock. And uh, as I said, this was man-made live rock, so this did not have a lot of live organisms on it. So I'm inoculating it with rock, some rock from the downstairs tank. And for people that are just beginning, what they might want to do is just trade a couple pieces of live rock with someone that has a tank. And by doing that, they'll uh, introduce all the organisms that they want into the system and into the tank. Now obviously this is going to be dirty for a while, but with a good skimmer and with that carbon running now, it uh, will all be clear by tomorrow morning. And then I'll 
move it around the way I want a little bit more. Yeah, and what I'm trying to do is get about an inch, inch and a half of substrate. You can see where I piled it, it's, it's relatively high, but I don't want it much higher than the top of the tank. And what I'm looking, or than the bottom rim of the tank here, uh -huh. and what I'm actually trying to do more than anything is just cover the uh, uh, bricks that are at the back of the tank that are holding up the substrate. And by doing that, it looks really natural. Take the second bag in. And so, just slice. So for the people who have established tanks, right, with sand beds, right, I always have right. tons of questions as far as, you know, um, again, sand sifting, making sure, you, you know, you stir it up once a week, that kind of thing. I don't really start once a week, but I start once a month when I do the water change. I, I do a 10% water change on all my tanks. Yep. You know, that's sort of the standard rule. You know, right. some people do nine, some do 11, but 10 has been what everybody's been advocating since I got into this hobby. Right. And it's really worked for me, but I, I have seen people that do a complete water change every week. Right. Uh, and I've seen people that do a water change once every six months. Right. So it all depends on what you're comfortable with. I have been successful with the 10% once a month, and I generally do it the first weekend of the month, so I always have the same system. Right schedule, right? So this is the first weekend of March, so the downstairs tank will be getting roughly a 40-gallon change, right. which it's a 300-gallon tank, but with the sumps, it's probably 400 gallons. Right. So it gets its 10% change. And I try to make it as easy as I can, so you can do your water change out of a garbage can, you can right. do it out of anything you want. Just try to make it as easy and simple as you can so it's less stressful on the tank. You don't want to take four hours doing a water change. Right, right. Uh, I try to do a water change in like 15, 20 minutes. Right. The corals are out of the water for a limited period of time while I do the water change, and that's one of the key things. Right. But I, I've not lost a coral yet that was out of the water because I was doing a water change. Right. At least I don't think I have. Right. But it, it, it's pretty simple to do. Uh, like I use RODI water and the salt's made up. The thing to do is you don't want to do a water change with salt water you just made up because freshly prepared seawater is very caustic. When I say freshly prepared with, from a synthetic mix, yep. so you want to give that at least three or four days to sort of mellow, for lack of a better term, and so it's not as caustic. And by doing that, uh, you don't really stress the organisms. You want to have it balanced for uh, temperature and pH and everything else and as many other parameters as right. you can. Right. Uh, I usually add a little bit of calcium to it, to the instant ocean, because it's just a little bit low in calcium, but that's about the only thing I do right. to make it different. And now when we look at your tank here, we had some corals in there? Yeah, they'll be fine. I used to think they would be stressed right. out, but right. they tolerate this pretty well. I mean. After seeing what corals go through when they're collected, mm -hmm. it's amazing that any even make it here. But the because uh, the the amount of trauma they go through. But this is not my ideal situation. But I didn't add really any of my prime corals in this tank. I added uh, frags and stuff just to see right. how well they're doing to see how stable the tank was. But uh, I mean, before I did this, I had some favas with their polyps open, so I know everybody was pretty happy in this tank. Right. I mean, the only thing that I did do was I put in a. Uh, frag of a cropper and I did bleach that which you know everyone talks about that these lights LED lights don't look that bright well the a cropper showed that it was pretty bright right, right. so I even with only running these lights at 60 percent I had it right at the top it did bleach out after three days so and I'm pretty sure that was it because all the other corals that are down lower have done fine right so then on the sand for example when you're doing your water changes, you scrape it up. What about the guys, I know there's some people that actually take a power head, right, and just blow the hell out of the sand. Yeah, I've done that too. And it, I mean, it gets a lot of the detritus out. The problem is it makes it so fine, unless you have a really good skimmer on afterwards, but your skimmer will tend to go nuts after you do that. Right, so right. you have to tone it down and turn it back up. Right. So I, I try not to traumatize the skimmer as much as I can <laughs> and make it as easy as I can. So just doing that takes a, a significant amount of uh, detritus out of the water. Basically this is where the tank's done for now. Uh, I'll give it till 24 hours to settle in. All the sand will be done, all the tank will be clear, and by tomorrow morning I can start adding stuff if I want, but I'll, I'll do another ammonia test just to make sure there's no ammonia in the tank. I'll blow off any sand that's accumulated on the rocks. I'll clean the algae a little bit. 
And if I need to add another bag of sand, I'll add it tomorrow mm -hmm. so as not to stress out the tank as I start adding stuff. But right now, uh, I know it doesn't look like it. It looks like it's a milk bath, but uh, <laughs> in 24 hours, this tank will be ready for corals and ready for fish. And we're good to go then because everything's in place. Uh, top off system, filters, uh, carbon and GFO, heaters, everything's working perfectly. So this is when you want to start adding stuff, after this obviously, <laughs> when everything is running perfectly, you know, what's going to happen. Well, so what we'll do is we'll come back in a couple of days and we'll kind of get it either hopefully before then or just after you kind of start loading some things up. That sounds great. <laughs>